Good morning, church. Nice to see you this morning. Those of you brave souls who have weathered the storm, so to speak, we're, I'm glad that you're here. Also, for those of you who are at home who may be in neighborhoods where it's still icy and still treacherous, I'm glad you made a decision to stay safe because now together we can worship the still speaking God, the God of radical, inclusive love, and that's the God that we worship here. So know that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. Delighted to have you. Um, also want to uh, invite Nancy McPherson, if Nancy's here. Nancy's gonna help us understand um, the connection with the visuals and our worship series. Hi, Nancy. Hi, glad to be here. Um, before I begin the description of the altar table, I wanted to take a moment to thank the many helpers that made um, Bethel's Advent and Christmas in our sanctuary so special. I know this is really belated, but, you know, due to the storm, but I still think it's important to do. So, uh, Kathy and I create kind of the most um, visible part of the, uh, the sanctuary, the chancel, but there's just so much more that goes into making Bethel uh, shine for Advent. The poinsettias were picked up and delivered by Nikki and Mo. The team of Jim and Jared kept the plants alive through the season, so thank you. <laughs> Um, Steve and Carol Thomas always provide us with a beautiful tree and also greens to decorate the church and um, the team of the Patches, the Tomas, Sue Pike and Jonathan Schleter hung the garlands and wreaths inside and out. Choir members helped us get the big art pieces up on the wall and um, all the families that lit the advent candles and shared readings, thank you. And even the sound and camera teams who worked, they're filming around those tall pew candles and everything else that was going on up here on any given Sunday. So um, I know there were a lot of other people that I'm forgetting to mention um, and who I never saw do what they did, uh, including the Bethel staff who collaborated on making the Narthex and Sanctuary really inviting, especially for visitors. So thank you to everyone who gave their time and effort to making Bethel a visually beautiful place to worship during Advent. So thank you very much. So, on to the season of Epiphany. This sermon series we're doing now, entitled A Deeper Life, started two weeks ago and will take us through Lent. One key component in living a deeper life is relationships. To love God and to love your neighbor is to cultivate relationships. Other important words used throughout the series will be fruitfulness, depth, cultivate, and overflow. With that in mind, we chose these symbols for the table. A tree to signify deep roots that must be cultivated to establish good relationships. Fruit of both the vine and the tree to represent the benefits of connection to each other, to God, and the bounty good relationships can bring. The largest object, the vessel overflowing with water, is a visual metaphor for the love God has for us, always overflowing. Roots, cultivation, sowing and reaping, water, all of these natural elements need each other, need a relationship to continue to thrive. As we're coming out of a cold, stormy week with many unexpected twists and turns, I think all of us have probably had the opportunity to be thankful for the many relationships that help us through the tough times, like family, church, neighbors, plumbers, PGE workers, road sanders, roofers, and tree removal services. Those relationships that hold us together so that we can get through the storms and eventually thrive again. We hope this table will bring greater meaning to David's messages as we learn together through this sermon series, How to Grow into a Deeper Life. Thank you. I would invite those of you who are able to stand and join with me in the responsive call to worship, which you'll see projected on the screen. And wherever you see bold, I invite you to use your voices along with me. Wind of life, song of God, breeze of freedom, you blow about us. You fill our lungs with blessing, and we sing praise. Breath of grace, call of Christ, word of promise, you whisper in our hearts. You fill our ears with hope, and we rise to our feet. 
spirit of love, presence of heaven, light of our hearts, you bear us in your arms. You fill our sails with courage and we follow you. Alleluia, arise, spirit of life, and transform us by your grace. And our first song is from Sing Prayer and Praise number 196. It's called Let It Shine. You can see the words on the screen. hearts, our minds, our voices, our spirits, together with the opening prayer. Together, let us pray. Creator God, you called your prophets to speak on your behalf. Your Christ called disciples to follow him. You call to us now, deep in our hearts. We listen for your voice. We wait for your will. We want to follow. Call us and we will follow in the Spirit of Christ. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from the letter to the Colossians. The purpose of Paul's letter was to remind the church that the fullness of God could be experienced through Christ. They did not need to add ascetic practices or formulate complex beliefs about angels or anything else. The passage we'll hear provides a portrait of a healthy worshiping community. Listen to the third chapter of the letter of the Colossians, verses 14 to 17. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Our second reading comes from Mark's Gospel we'll hear a conversation between Jesus and a person who seeks to live by God's will. 
Our theme for today is loving God with our spirit. Paul seems to suggest that we need all of who we are to love with our spirit, our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Hear now from the 12th chapter of Mark's Gospel, verses 28 through 34. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? And Jesus answered, the first is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and beside him there is no other. And to love him with all your heart, with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom. And that no one dared to ask him any questions. May God bless our hearing of these words and may God's blessing invite us to a deeper life of faith. Thank you, Paige. Would you pray with me a moment? Holy One, may the indwelling spirit, which is deep within us, rise and speak. Speak what we need to hear this morning, for we yearn to follow in the footsteps of your Son, Jesus, who for us is the Christ, and it's in his name and spirit that we pray and say together, Amen. So we are in the liturgical season called Epiphany. And Epiphany celebrates the ways that the birth of Christ, that is, God's taking on human flesh that we celebrate at Christmas, continues to be revealed today. I've been using an online resource called Working Preacher. The particular series is called, as Nancy mentioned, A Deeper Life. And the series focuses on five ways that we can deepen our lives by loving God with our minds, which was our topic and theme for last week, and we shared Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from the Birmingham jail. This week we'll talk about loving God with our spirits, and then we'll deepen our lives by loving God with our bodies, by loving our comfortable neighbors, and by loving our uncomfortable neighbors neighbors. So stay tuned, my friends. So today our focus will be on loving God with our spirits. And of course, this series is simply expanding the great commandment from Jesus to love God and love neighbor. This is the heart of the gospel lesson this morning. A man, he's described as a scribe. Sometimes when we hear that word scribe, it's overlaid with, oh, there's a bad guy. Let's think about that scribe as a seeker instead, because he was seeking a deeper life and he wanted to ask Jesus about it. And of course, Jesus offered the commandment, the golden rule to love God and to love your neighbor. And when the seeker recognized the power of the truth of Jesus' commandment and said, I see that love of God and neighbor is more important than any other form of worship, Jesus responded, you're not far from the kingdom of heaven. Now, I've always loved Jesus' description of not being too far from the kingdom of God. And I don't think I would have been silent like the rest of the crowd. I probably would have asked some more questions like, what are you getting at, Jesus? I think there are two ways Jesus was trying to tell us something. The first is it's, means that the man is standing right next to the incarnation of God's love. So you could see that it's, Jesus could be saying, you know, I'm, I'm here. This is the kingdom of God, so you're close. Or 
It could be that Jesus was saying, now that you know what it is that you need for a deeper love, a deeper life, all you need to do is practice it, which of course is difficult. And of course, you never arrive. It's a lifelong journey. You're drawing near to the kingdom of God. Just keep working at it. The other text from Colossians describes a healthy worshiping community. And Paul says to the Colossians and to us, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your heart, sing praises, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And that's what we do when we're here in worship, my friends. Why is this important? Because, as Paul says, we are clothed in love and participate together in the body of Christ. Now, it's no secret that mainline Protestant churches have been in decline for several decades. There are lots of factors contributing to that. A significant one is captured by the popular phrase, and I'm sure you've heard it, spiritual but not religious. Have you heard that? In fairness to those who identify as spiritual but not religious, there are a number of ways in which organized religion has been so rigid and focused on purity that many have felt judged or excluded. For lots of folks, organized religion caused more harm than good. And I can understand why they may want to distance themselves from any form of organized or institutionalized religion. The weakness of spiritual but not religious, from my perspective, is that it can become overly focused on the individual's interior life. That is, it can become another expression of consumerism. I'll be spiritual because it makes me feel better. I can consume it. I can do whatever I want when I want as a spiritual person. While that's important, Jesus' commandment demands that we be aware of our well-being and the well-being of others, and that's how it is that we love God. Or to use the words of my friend and colleague Lillian Daniel, the spiritual but not religious worldview leaves adherents far removed from community and right smack in the bland majority of people who find ancient religions dull but find themselves uniquely fascinating. <laughs> now, Lillian is not known for pulling punches uh, with her words, and she's currently the conference minister in the state of Michigan. Um, but I think she's on to something here. It's, we are uniquely fascinating, I believe, each one of us. But that's an important component of Christian spirituality, but it's not an exclusively private and individual practice. Does it involve private experiences of the holy? Absolutely. Can it be divorced from participation in community? No, it can't. I'm sure you won't be surprised when I point out that scholars and academics of social sciences have struggled over the years to define spiritual. There are tons of definitions. Let's try one. For me, the core element of spirituality is the awareness of being connected to someone or something. Spirituality opens our hearts, our minds, our bodies to everything else we are related to or are in relationship with. If you're a visual learner, imagine that spirituality looks something like a spider's web. At the center, I believe, is an un unbreakable union with our spirit and God's spirit. So just for a minute, imagine a spider web. Because of that union in the center, we can begin to imagine and appreciate the way in which we are connected to all life as those strands go out. Now, I believe in giving credit where credit is due, and I'm borrowing this image from Molly Mitchell's Ecclesiastical Council, which happened a couple weeks ago. And while one questioner pointed out that a spider's web also happens to be a death trap, I happen to think 
that there are more positive ways of seeing ourselves as interrelated if we do visualize a spider's web. Because let's face it, they're flexible, they're resilient, they're strong. They can help us see, visualize that we, at our core, are grounded in God's love. And they can help us see how that love can reach out through many strands and in many different directions. Or, if you prefer a different image, consider your spirit and God's spirit as inseparable, something like a small stone. And you know when you drop a small stone into the water, it has a ripple effect. And so that's a way in which we are connected by the union of our spirit and God's spirit, and it flows out into the world. For most of us who are drawn to and fed by a progressive church like Bethel, we're strong on taking action in the area of social justice and outreach efforts. We're more comfortable acting out our faith than talking about it. That's one of the reasons I'm an ordained UCC minister. I've also learned from my own experience that doers, like me, can overemphasize the community aspect of Christian spirituality, the putting into practice the love of God and our connection with that love. So this isn't a criticism, it's an essential component of our particular tribe of Christians. But I don't know about you, as, as a doer, I can get worn out, especially in the world in which we live. There are so many social justice issues, I can feel overwhelmed by them. And I don't know about you, but I have experienced a sense of foreboding when we consider the direction our country could take in the next year or two. Many of us have, have a prayer practice which is integral to loving God with our spirit. Some of you, if you're honest, and I've had people say this to me, I don't even know how to pray, I don't know what to pray, and I don't know when to pray, and I'm not even sure if prayer makes any difference. It does, and we can all learn. So for me lately, I've been having headaches. I've had some bouts of vertigo and dizziness. I've wondered whether these are returning symptoms of long COVID, which many of you know I dealt with for over a year. Or is it something as simple as digging through the ice with Jim and Jared all day and not drinking enough water and being dehydrated? I took my blood pressure yesterday. It was high. Not high enough to go to the ER, but high enough to be concerned. I googled how to lower blood pressure. Here are the suggestions. Lose weight. Well, okay, I'm carrying a few extra pounds, but I don't think that's a real issue. Exercise. Well, check, I do that. I walk every day with, the, with Finnegan, at least two miles a day. Reduce drinking alcohol. Check, I've done that. Reduce stress. Oh, oh, there's an interesting one. Yeah, that's easy. Just dial back the, the, the throttle on stress, my friends. Yeah, I can't check that one off. Take a hot shower or bath and meditate. Then I realized I have been so preoccupied with the challenges of the world that I have not been faithful to a practice of centering prayer which I have learned from over the years is absolutely essential, but I forget. Anybody else have a practice that they forget? So simply stopping long enough to breathe and quiet your mind can work wonders. In addition to being distracted by the troubles of the world, I was also cold yesterday. You know how you get cold and you get cold to the bone, to the core, and you can't get warmed up? So I took that hot shower. And then I practiced that ancient prayer, 
centering prayer, which is a form of Christian meditation. We don't have to go to the Eastern religions to know that meditation is an integral part of Christian faith. So I know if you're thinking of, I'm going to start talking about centering prayer, you'd probably rather have a pencil stuck in your eye if you're a person who has trouble staying still. And you know what? It is hard, and it takes practice, because our minds are usually going at warp speed. I don't know about you, but my mind can go at warp speed a lot. Um, so when I practice centering prayer, I simply get comfortable in an upright position with my feet flat on the floor, not slumped over in a lazy boy. That's good if you need sleep, and if you need sleep, that's probably what you should do. But if you want to experiment with centering prayer, you get that comfortable position with your eyes closed or nearly closed. Of course, you have to silence your cell phone and turn off the TV set, not stare at the screen of any sort to minimize distractions. Some folks find lighting a candle helps set the tone. Then you just breathe, and you become aware of the tension that's in your body, and you let it go. Just be aware of your breath, and let it slow down. You have to practice patience and grace for yourselves, because you'll get distracted. Thoughts may start racing through your head. You may hear an ambulance siren. A dog may bark in the neighborhood. A cat may jump in your lap. You may even wonder, have I lost my mind trying to sit still and do nothing else? The answer is no, you haven't. You just might find it. After a few minutes, after I've been breathing and being quiet, I ask myself and I say, just go down go down and it's kind of a mantra that I use after I've been quiet and watching my breath for a while just go down and I just kind of keep doing that for a while and then I'll ask myself an open-ended question what is God trying to tell me or what is it that I need to hear so let's just take a minute of watching your breath and practicing this centering prayer I'm not going to sit, I'm going to stand, but I invite you to kind of close your eyes if you're comfortable and to take two deep breaths in, breathe in deeply, and exhale. Deep breath in, and exhale. Now just watch your breath coming in and going out. Coming in. And going out. Don't worry if somebody's watching you. They should be having their eyes closed and breathing. But if you're not comfortable, that's okay. You can open your eyes. I would encourage you to try being quiet for a minute and then two, and then five, and then 15, and then 20 is sort of the magic number. Because oftentimes it takes at least five or 10 minutes to sort of purge yourself from all the stuff that you're carrying around all the time, right? Can I get a witness on that? So yesterday, after discovering that my blood pressure was way too high, and I took that hot shower and did centering prayer. I started with a prayer that you may want to consider, and it's one I've shared with you before, and it goes like this. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. Fill my heart with your love and my mind with your peace. Sometimes that can just open things up for you. So I stayed quiet for a few minutes, and as I said, I opened myself to hear from God, what do I need to hear from you? And what I heard was, stop pushing. 
I'm holding you. Stop pushing. I've got you. I took my blood pressure. It had gone from 172 over 86 to 126 over 68. And I share my experience not to show how wonderful your minister is at centering prayer or that it's just something unique to people who ordain. Let me reassure you, friends, this is an accessible practice for all of us. And some of us will insist, I can't do it. And that may be true. But you can experiment with some other ways of entering into a quiet. Perhaps it's listening to some contemplative music. That may move you into a quieter place. It may be sitting outdoors. Outside. I wouldn't suggest it today. <laughs> but when it is conducive for being outside, sometimes the messages that come from God's greater world can open us to what we need to hear. So... Interestingly enough, I started by emphasizing that individual spiritual practice can be a completely interior exercise, and here I have shared with you an interior spiritual exercise. It's because being socially active and standing up and working for what's right in the world is absolutely essential. Being a part of this community and supporting one another, as Nancy said, so many people were supportive to one another during this, during this terrible storm that we had. So yes, we are people of community and we need one another. Paul says we need to teach one another and admonish. Well, admonish sounds a little too preachy to me. I'd rather say teaching and supporting, helping and showing. So what happens when I do this centering prayer is that I become less anxious and I become more present to myself and the world around me which means I'm more able to be a healthy member of a community in the body of Christ rather than a distracted one. Can I get a witness on that? So, try it. You might like it. And if you want a lesson or if you want some more resources about Centering Prayer, I'm happy to share them with you. Because, my friends, we need to find ways to be grounded in a world that is so turbulent and turmoily and spinning around crazily. Can I get a witness on that? Be well, my friends. And together we say, Amen.
Please be seated. I had a colleague say to me one time, and you may want to experiment with this the next time you sing Amazing Grace. There are times when I feel like a wretch, and there are times when I don't feel like a wretch. So you could experiment with who saved a soul like me. Theologically, something for you to chew on a little bit. Talk about it on your way home. There's an alternative Lord's Prayer, which I want us to use. It's, it's from the Native American indigenous translation of the Bible. So when I finish my prayer and we move into the Lord's Prayer, I invite you to look up at the screen and, and use some different words to capture uh, a similar meaning. So let us be at quiet prayer. Gracious and loving God, full of wisdom and abounding in steadfast love, we offer ourselves to you just now in prayer. You've heard the prayers of your people, inviting support for folks who are struggling with illness or grieving death. We also give thanks for all the ways that neighbors and communities showed up. We celebrate birthdays. We celebrate the friendships that we enjoy, those that we have just made and those that have been long-standing. for this community, for our resilience, for our strength to stay strong to our mission, that you are a God of unconditional love. Where we're hungry, feed us. And where we're scared, calm us. And where we are wondering what you're up to in our lives. Give us patience and eyes to see and grace for ourselves to let you reveal yourself. Holy One, we are mindful of the weather and the way in which not only did it affect our lives, but it continues to affect lives across the country, across the globe. We are so aware of our gratefulness and thanksgiving for having safe, comfortable homes in which to live, and our hearts go out to those who we know are living outside, some of them who have died because of the weather. May the leaders of our country take diplomatic approaches to avoid more violence, more war. For we know that you are a God of peace. And that your son, Jesus, who was our guide and pioneer of our faith, showed us the power of nonviolence and the way in which it's the only way to move in and through conflict. So equip us, O oh God, for the living of our lives with integrity, with honesty, with courage, and with hope, so that we can be lights to the people who may be in the shadows for whatever reason. And now, O oh God, we invite our spirits to gather together and words together with the Lord's Prayer from First Nations Version an indigenous translation of the New Testament. Together, let us pray this alternative Lord's Prayer. O great spirit, our Father from above, we honor your name as sacred and holy. Bring your good road to us, where the beauty of your ways in the spirit world above 
is reflected in the earth below. Provide for us day by day the elk, the buffalo, and the salmon, the corn, the squash, and wild rice, all the things we need for each day. Release us from the things we have done wrong. In the same way, we release others for the things done wrong to us. Guide us away from the things that tempt us to stray from your good road and set us free from the evil one and his worthless ways. Aho, may it be so. My friends, we've come to the time in our worship service where we simply lift up the opportunity to support our church, to give with your time, talent, and treasure. On the screen, you see some opportunities and ways to do that. Easy electronically, if that's the way you do most of your banking and support a variety of um, efforts, organizations. Um, or you can drop a gift in the plate, or you can use the U.S. mail, which will eventually get through. Pray with me now the prayer of dedication. We give thanks for all we have received, O oh God, gifts of love and time, money and abilities. Whether we place our gifts in the offering plates or send them through cyberspace or the mail, what we give is a small portion of the gifts we have received from you. Bless those who receive them just as we are blessed in the act of sharing them. Amen. And our final song, again, is found from the Sing Prayer and Praise, number 161, Open My Eyes, Lord. 161, Sing Prayer and Praise. Might want to stand. So turn to the left, and turn to the right, and turn around. Our eyes are open. 
to see God's face. May it be a blessing for you and for the people you see and meet this week. May it be so by the power of God's Holy Spirit, which is deep within us and shared when we love. The people are heard to say, Amen. For the month of February, we're going to coordinate two wonderful events. Um, the first one is we're going to um, coordinate where we're going to go to the movies to see a documentary by Rob Reiner. It's called God and Country. And the goal of this documentary is to um, wake up church goers, um, American Christians who number in many to tens of millions to the threat of anti-democracy of religious extremists in the United States. So that's the first one. The second one that we're coordinating is going to be at Reeser. Um, Reeser and um, the Red Door has um, coordinated a um, presentation, um, Evolve um, Experience. It's an award-winning series, a monologue that inspired true dialogue. Um, it's a simple and powerful idea. You see and hear real life stories from racial diverse police officers, judges, and community members. Um, emerge, move, and prepare to evolve the conversation about racial injustice. My name is Emma Stewart, and today is the start of a book drive I'm holding here at Bethel. Uh, some of the books I'll be collecting will be placed in mini libraries I'm building throughout my neighborhood, and the rest will be donated to the Children's Book Bank. The books should range for ages 0 to 20, Dan, we are so grateful that you're with us this morning. Do you have something that you can send us out with? 